Recording is in progress. All right, let's reshare. I'm not repeating what I said. I will send Eddie a report as I normally do. Um, can, we, can we just recap what, what we did? Because we gave the minutes and we moved them second. And we don't have to do the minutes again. Hey, just, just, to, just to recap, we did have the reading of the minutes. It was moved and seconded. The minutes have been accepted. And now we're doing the treasurer's report. Go ahead, Rich. All right, so yeah, I mentioned stuff about us having a lot more money and there'll be more detail in the treasurer's report is in the Eddie for the minutes, but kicking off where I was, uh, where, where I just left off, we talked about primary scholarship and getting the uh, checks in for um, Boardwalk Astronomy. Georgie June is also nice and healthy. Um, so we're fully funded for this year to pay the thousand out and we're more than halfway there to next year. Um, and mainly because Sean and George are like raffle ticket selling machines. So they've been getting a lot of ticket sales um, as well as every year that in that check came in this month, um, Georgie June's older sister sends us a $250 um, donation to go to the scholarship fund. So um, that you do send her a card. So um, our scholarships after kind of being a little bleak the last two months are now very good. And um, we're, we're, we're set for this year and well positioned for next year. Um, and our general fund is healthy. We have enough mon uh, money to fund all of our events throughout the year. Um, his membership has been, continues to be strong. We had four new members join this month or uh, in March. We had one join in April, which is not in this number. So we're up to 163. Um, and we're already getting money coming in for East Coast Star Party. We've had three registrations so far. Um, and our major expense this month was uh, we did do a an apparel order. So that was a couple. Yeah, so we took 500 but We bought $500 worth of clothes. Most of that had already been paid for. But still, we're up over $1,600 um, for the month. So that's all I got. And if you have any other questions, hit them with me. Hit me with them now. I'm ready. We have a uh, motion to accept the reading of the treasurer's report. Move to accept the treasurer's report. Second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Treasurer's report has been accepted. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to have the vice president come, our outreach coordinator, tell us about the schedule. Okay, thank you. I. Um... Now, the camera set it exactly right. I did get remember to give you ability to share. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're gonna make mine quick. 50%. We'll talk about the calendar of events just for this month, and you can refer to the night sky. I gotta find it first. Wait a minute. I have it here. What do I do with it? I had it here. Now I don't know where I opened up a new thing. Now I got to log in again. We're still there. All right. I'm sorry to delay here. I'm going to have to log in again, I guess. <laughs> Of course, it doesn't remember my number, and I can't remember my number, so I'll log in real fast. Okay. And I'll share in just a second here, the club calendar. Okay, now I'm ready to share. Okay, can everybody see the club calendar for April? You guys seen it out in the in Never Never Land out there? Okay, we're at uh, April 6th right now for the club meeting. Next week is Spring Info STEM, 11 o'clock. A.M. 
And we usually get the retired guys to volunteer like me and George and a few other guys. And that's at the Joseph E. Parker Rec Center in Portsmouth. So I think we still need some volunteers for that. I don't know how many. We need six and we've got three, we got two. Okay, so please volunteer for that if you can. Uh, Corn Watch and Science Day at Nansamon at 9 a.m. Friday. I'm gonna go to that too. Um, Saturday, Pack 901 Tiger Den Adventure, and at the, it's at this on the same day, Skywatch. So what I've done is I've put combined both of those events at the same location. That that way you don't have to go to two different things. So the pack, the Tiger Den Pack will be there early at six o'clock at Northwest River Park, and the rest of the North Northwest River Park will start at eight o'clock. So we can show them the sun and a few constellations and stuff before everybody gets there. All right, Corn Watch and uh, next week, Dowdy, Dowdy Parks Star Party. <laughs> it's almost a tongue twister. Dowdy Park Star Party, that's in, uh, in Nags Head. And it's a 6 p.m. to 9 a.m. the next day. So it's the first time we've been out there in a while. This thing's not acting very good. So please volunteer for that. I'm not gonna check and see how many volunteers we got for that, but that's gonna be a nice star party too. Uh, on Saturday, uh, we're, we're jam packed with events, a North Carolina state star party viewing. And let me see where that is real fast. It's, it's just a one night thing. It's a one, that's yeah, a one night. I'm trying to get it to come up. I can't get it to come up. Those in the Dismal Swamp. North Dismal North Swamp, North okay, good. North Carolina. Dismal Swamp State Park in North Carolina. Thank you. Just over the border. Right. Just across the border. Yeah. Right. Hickory High School stargazing. Uh, I think there's me, there's two volunteers for that so far. That's on a Monday, starting at 6 p.m. Astronomy 101 at the Kempsville Rec Center. Uh, number four of the one, two, and three have been very successful. N number one, it rained pretty good, but we still were successful for the indoor part. So we need some more telescopes. If you can come out and share the show, share your visions with the uh, the Astronomy 101. That's it at uh, Campsville Rec Center. Malibu Elementary Science at 5.30. I think that goes for three hours. Brookwood Elementary, it's at the same time as Garden Stars on the 27th. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to split, split up the resources here. I can go to the Brookwood and I know George is probably planning on going to Garden Stars. Ocean Lake STEM, uh, STEM night, STEAM night, that's the, uh, the extra A for arts is uh, 6 p.m. on Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday at 10, International Astronomy Day at 12. And that that's, might be a slight conflict. Maybe you can come by and do the Saturday, Sunday, and then leave a little bit early for the Astronomy Day if you want to do both. Otherwise, please RSVP on, on these events. I've got a question for you. Yes. Where is the Astronomy Day where is the astronomy day help? Ah, it's, it's not Portsmouth Library. Portsmouth Library. Library. I'm glad you guys are there because I can't click it and get it to work anymore. Okay, Portsmouth Library yeah, at 12. They're doing it at the Neo Central Library and they have the same restrictions that they've had before. So. Okay. All right, so I won't go into April other than the first, you, you, you can see fourth, fifth, and sixth. So we are pretty chock a block on events for this month and next month too. And uh, I, I've resolved several conflicts and made people reschedule for later so we don't have two or three things going at once. I also took up the advice of somebody that, it, that suggested last time that these Cub Scout, Scout events, we should try to team those up. I think it was you, Jeff. Try to team those uh, events up together and have two, two Cub Scout <laughs> events, for example, at the same time at the same place. So we're doing that too. We did that with the, uh, with the uh, Tiger Den at the same time at Skywatch. Any questions on April? I'll just skip May because we got a nice program for you today. No questions? Okay, thank you. I will stop share and give it back to El Presidente. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, is our scholarship chairman here online? I don't see him. Yeah, he's not online. So uh, I guess we won't have a scholarship report. Has anyone checked the mailbox recently? I don't know. I haven't. I've been out of town, so I haven't. 
Uh, ben sent me a, a package probably two weeks ago. So it's been probably two or three weeks. It's not bad. You get a chance, George. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I'd be willing to bet um, our insurance payment, usually that comes in March. Yeah, yeah. the scholarship applications <clears throat> have been sent out to the schools, uh, and it's online too, I believe. Yeah. And uh, the deadline for scholarship applications is the 1st of May. So the children or students have another month to get their applications in, and they have to provide their GPA, a copy of their SAT, uh, just a, a SAT or CAT scores, not CAT, whatever. And uh, a recommendation from a teacher and a 500 word essay about what they like or what they their experience with astronomy. So hopefully uh, I'll go ahead and check the mailbox and we'll be checking it more regularly to see if those uh, applications are coming in. Uh, time for the Alcor report, uh, astronomical league coordinator, Bruce Powers. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, so um, I, I have scoured the Reflector magazine once again for our fine organization, and uh, we did not have any observing awards uh, for this particular uh, issue, but uh, again, I, I would encourage uh, everybody to um, look into these awards. Many of them do not require uh, large, sophisticated telescopes at all. Uh, there's even, uh, I was looking through here tonight, um, there's uh, programs in here for kids, uh, uh, there's citizen science uh, ideas, uh, there's uh, meteor observing. So there, there's lots of programs that um, you can do through the Astronomical League. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, uh, when I can actually get out to a meeting, which I hope is next month, I, I want to try to start highlighting uh you know one program a month or so so anyhow um yes and uh when we get to observing reports i'll, I'll talk briefly about my uh fun out at the uh, staunton river star party okay thank you bruce um uh, time for old business old business so we have an apparel order that has come in um uh, sean you want to tell us how much you got there we got a lot of, a lot of stuff. So if you ordered it, please come over here before the meeting's over and I'll give you what you ordered. If you ordered <laughs> something, you'll have it here with you, pick with him tonight. So pick it up. If you ordered it like the last month. Yeah. If you didn't order anything, but you still want to get a t-shirt or a hat, we've got extras, right? Yeah, we did order some extra. We have extra t-shirts, so check the color and the size and uh, you can get it tonight. How much are they? <laughs> Just pick a number out of the air. Like <laughs> we are a set amount of money. <laughs> I'll look on the website too. I don't remember. Big t shirt $12. Oh, yeah. Less than 20 so I think it was 15 uh, I mean, It used to be 12 but thanks to inflation, things have gone up. I think it's right, right, right around 15 Okay, that's the apparel order. BBAA t shirts and hats and so forth. Old business uh, item number two is the East Coast Star Party Resurrection. And I'll turn it back over to our East Coast Star Party Committee Coordinator, Bruce Powers. Okay. Uh, hey, can we uh, share the screen, please? Or I'll just do it. Hold yeah, on. so if you want to share, you, got, you have to do it. All right. Prepare for launch. Okay, can people see my screen? Yep. Okay, so first of all, uh, I, I'm I'm just a shill here for Mr. Sean Lozier, okay? So Sean Lozier put this totally awesome Star Party webpage together for the reincarnation of the East Coast Star Party, as you can see there, hopefully September 14th through 17th. Um, if you uh, get on the Back Bay Astro uh, website over on the far right, Sean, our web professional, has created a, a fine uh, website to be admired by all. 
Okay. So um, this is September 14th through 17th. And um, I, I'm, I'm just a shill here for all of Sean's awesome work. Can you all see this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, be, be sure to, to uh, check through all of uh, Sean's hard work here. He's put together some pictures from uh, past parties. Um, and let's see, registration is here. Uh, it's pretty straightforward at uh, 60 bucks uh, Thursday through Sunday morning. If you got any particular questions, um, the main folks fielding all these are uh, Sean, myself, and uh, Rich. Uh, so what else is on here? The location, of course, is at Chip Oaks Plantation State Park. Um, thank you so much to everybody who came out in early March um, and did basically a site survey and based on that site survey, Sean Lozier, the man, the myth, the legend, put together this awesome website, okay? So if you want to know where it is, how much it costs, uh, how much coffee you're going to need to observe for three nights in a row, all of that's here. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, the observing field is uh, you've got a wonderful horizon, except you know a little bit of obscuration in the north. Um, so uh, that's what the field looks like out of Chip Oaks State Park. The uh, 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 folks have been very, um, the, the park ranger out there has been very, very accommodating to us and has really uh, done an awesome job um, working with us to set everything up. Okay, now I have to stop this somehow. So about the field, you know, he had the nice fields, but there was also, he has marked there, there's power. There are right. a couple receptacles for recharging batteries. Um, Ruth mentioned, you know, figure out how much coffee you need, but we are going to have an endless coffee pot out there. And then right. so down here, it's about a five minute walk. If you look at the bottom right, there's flush bathrooms. We will have porta johns out there, but if you need a, something a little bit more, it's, it's like a five, we, we walked, it's like five minutes. There's actual uh, flush toilets. Yeah. So it's there's potable water there too, where, where the electrical is. Yes, there is. Yeah. So it's going to be a nice, real nice location. We walked it. it can't ask for much more than that. Um, if you have a camper or even a tent, um, I can certainly, I'm, I'm an RV camper. I can certainly recommend um, the uh, campsites at um, Chip Oaks. They're all very clean and, and well maintained. Um, so our hosts, um, and I, I'm just a shill for Sean Loger. Sean built all this. Um, the uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation, Herbert State of Virginia, of course, Back Bay, and then also the, the Friends of Chip Oaks State Park. Um, and then the rules, please, please read and heed the rules. Um, Sean did a great job. I worked with him to uh, build these out. Um, uh, if you show up, just make sure you read through those. Yes, it's a, almost a direct copy of the Stone River Star Party, but hey, you know, uh, flattery is the best uh, uh, form of a compliment. So anyhow, registration is uh, 60 bucks, which is very reasonable, and that gets you uh, all of those fine products there. Um, we are uh, revamping this after a hiatus at the prior location. Uh, after about a five-year absence, and I, I really, really got to thank uh, everybody that came out uh, at the beginning of March for our site visit. So uh, please um, stay tuned for more news. But uh, Sean Lozier is the man for all of this website. He built it out. So I, I want everybody to give a round of applause right now to Sean Lozier. They're in the audience, please. All right. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Bruce. That's very good. Uh, so put that on your calendar, the 14th through the 17th of September. We've got all the information here on the website. I got an observing for, for, for what we do them. Okay. Williamsburg Hotel? Williamsburg. Okay. Williamsburg is a ferry right away. So, yeah. Most hotels know, Surrey, probably in Surrey, Williamsburg. It's in Surrey. Surrey might have one. Uh, Brent, uh, Airbnb or I don't know. I don't know if there's what, what's in Surrey, but uh, nothing. Uh, but, like, as Sean says, you can take a certain take a ferry 
across <laughs> to Williamsburg and uh, a, a car ferry so you could drive. The ferry is free and it runs apparently all year long. Right. So I don't know how long it takes to get across there, but. It's a nice, it's, it's, I've it's been there. Field. It's fun. It's, it's a good set field and uh, it's very right. Oh, is there any other old business? Okay, is there any new business? Jeff? I did uh, write a letter to Chip and Joanna. I hope not personal. Maybe it's personal, but not. I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, hopefully we can attend the Waco Solar Eclipse, total solar eclipse, April 8th next year. So you're in a few days from today. And uh, I made it sound like we were the greatest club or we're, we've been given so many awards and thanks to Sean of course, and everybody else. But uh, I think maybe this time we might get a, a better response. So far, I've yet been given two no's, but I don't give up. That's the new business I have. So Jeff has a request in to Chip and Joanna Gaines out in Waco, Texas. Maybe show up there for the uh, solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024. Are they on the line? Online. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're the in the total, the totality. Yeah. How long are they on the center? Four minutes of totality. Not okay. Exactly, do we, close. Do we have any observing reports? Yeah, I got one. Yes, the Stanton River Star Party. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to share again, real briefly here. Okay. So. Uh, this this is me. Uh, my boss always told me that I was outstanding in my field. So here I am. I am literally standing out in my field. Um, <laughs> so um, anywho, I, I had a blast as always at the uh, Stout River Star Party. Um, managed to get uh, four good nights of observing with uh, all my logs here. Um, so this is a, a, a me 10 inch on the left. And um, I don't know what came over me, but um, one of our alumni, actually still current member, uh, Jim Tallman, uh, helped me uh, reset up my little um, uh, all sky camera over here on the right. So I, I, I actually got back into astrophotography. I don't know what came over me. Anyway, I had a blast. Um, the Stott River Star Party is always a, a very well organized event. Um, a lot of people at that event are mentoring us and, and guiding us for uh, the restart of the East Coast Star Party. So kudos to to all of them. Um, they they were a great help. I, I picked their brain about how to do things, you know, while we we're out there. So please notice that I have a a, a retro East Coast Star Party T-shirt, um, which uh, I hope we'll uh, get some new ones for our revamp this fall and. Uh, I logged uh, four, four, four good nights, and uh, I was able to find a, a new record, M109, at 82 million light years away. So it is dark, dark, dark out there. I, I can't say enough good things about heading out to uh, Staunton River and um, camping and uh, meeting with fellow astronomers. There's probably about 40 of us out there uh, on the peak nights, and they have uh, awesome food and uh, it's 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 something worth your time, even if you don't have you know a big scope or anything like that. It's worth it just for for binoculars. And we do have a public night where folks come out and we show them stuff too. Okay, that's it. Hey, thank you, Bruce. Yes, I I'll vouch for that. The Stanton River Star Party is a very friendly group, and the, the horizons are good. The skies are nice and dark, so it's, uh, they hold that twice a year in, in March and in October. So uh, you can put that on your calendar too. Are there, is there any other old business or any other observing reports? I had a question. Not a oh, question. Thing, but question. I had a question. Yes. We're yeah, yeah, I haven't been able to come to a meeting in a while, and to the, I notice now they have they're having a sign in. Um, should I have my ID, my my Bat Bay ID with me when I come to the come here for a meeting? Or? This is the first time we have oh, ever is. had to sign in and show okay. ID. Okay, I was just curious. You guys have to sign in downstairs. Leah has. Continue to need to sign in. There was some events that happened at other campuses, not this one. Um, so they are checking all student IDs. Um, but you, they should know that you all are coming each month. 
um, I remind them and I'll remind them even better. But you still have to show your ID and um, write your name down probably for, it could be years. Is this like our club ID? Or no, 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 you're, you're, you're right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I don't know what my club ID is. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. it's still a sign. Well, we had a car, and I don't know if you called it an ID. Many years ago. Yeah, many years ago. I don't have it anymore. It's it's somewhere in papers in my house. I don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm lying. Yeah. All that. <laughs> Any other observing reports? Jeff. Yeah, I had a chance uh, last month to go to uh, Reykjavik, Iceland and tour the whole island all the way around. And uh, you talked about dark skies. They're extremely dark on the north side of, of the island of Iceland. Um, I was able to see Aurora Borealis on the first night, the second to the last, and the last night they were astronomical. That was that Friday night, that Stanton River, people were able to see them in Virginia, but in uh, Iceland, um, they were out, they outshined the streetlights. They were incredible. So if you go, make sure you get your heaviest jacket you got and be prepared to be really cold. <laughs> if you go to Iceland, it's cold. Where are your long johns? And they, uh, they, they love Americans. During the first or second world war, there was 30,000 American troops there. And they appreciated it ever since. Great, okay, thanks Jeff. Any other observing reports? Okay, we'll go right into our presentation. Our presentation is on meteorites. Mark Ost is our presenter. He is a retired geologist and a longtime BBAA member. And so, Mark, why don't you go, come on up here and uh, tell us what you're going to tell us? Yes, thank you very much. Let me get to the PowerPoint here. It's a. Uh, it we'll is. See. By the way, if you're not here, if you're watching on Zoom, you won't be able to handle. The meteors. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna put it on, on live Facebook. There we go. I hope I didn't cut anyone out. Sorry about it. Well, not that sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's very nice. I really do appreciate y'all inviting me here. This is special for me because hey, Mark. Not only, as George said, your screen. A meeting in a few thousand years, but also I started as a student ages ago here, and then in grad school went to an adjunct instructor. And spent very many happy, very many happy days at the community college. In fact, it's Thursday night, and I would be over at the Chesapeake campus doing a late night lab, and everyone looks at you like this at 10:30 at night. But it's a real pleasure to be back. Excuse me, Mark. Did you yeah. share the screen yet? I'm sorry. Have you shared the screen? Uh, no. If yeah. not, no, but if you don't can see that, oh. I can see it. Oh, what? Do you know how to get, get yeah, it to we'll do get that? For you. I'll do it. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, we're doing Facebook Live too. If anybody's out there, I think there's three people watching so far. It's Marcos to get ready to show his meteorite collection. And you guys see it? Great, thank you. Now we're showing it to the, uh, the Zoom people too. Great. Well, well, let's get going. Nobody wants. I'm going to keep the talk very short and very brief. Nobody wants a lecture. What I'd like to do is have most of the time to come up and look at the collection of meteorites. A lot of these samples are small, and actually that's a good thing because it's easier to analyze. Not only do I have small samples up here, each sample has a brief description of it. There are also a microscope and illuminated sources so that you can just take it and put it under whatever viewing device you'd like. It's free for the night. Okay, meteorites. Meteorites are important. That particular meteorite there is at the Archenhold Observatory in Germany. Uh, the girl, just out of interest, is the great great granddaughter of the founder of the uh, observatory. Uh, he was replaced during the Nazi era. He, uh, his wife and daughter were uh, his wife and daughter were killed in a concentration camp. Uh, so it's an interesting it's an interesting history. I know the family. Uh, the meteor that she's got her hands on there is from Canyon Diablo. It's from Meteor Crater in Arizona. And let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, there are basically three types of meteorites. There's, they break them into all different classifications and things, but all we care tonight is about the three basic types. Stones. Take it out of galleries. 
Is that what it is? All set? There we go. Stone meteorite. Stone meteorite is self explanatory. It's made of minerals. If you want to call them rocks, you'd be perfectly fine. Uh, that's probably the most common of them. They're important because this is the only access that we have to primordial materials that make up the solar system. On Earth, the oldest rock, maybe 3.5 billion. This is a nice example here. Uh, I'll pass it around. There are crystals in here, but full of black dots. There's zircons. This is from a mud tank, carbonatite in Australia. These zircons have been dated at about 2.5 billion years old. But really, anything that goes past 3.5, there's nothing left. It's all been recycled. Meteorites are the only way that you can directly access it. So if you'd like to look at it, what do we do to pass that around and take a look? It's heavy, it's good for throwing through windows. <laughs> oh, Next one, please, Sean. Thank you. Stony irons. Okay, stony irons. Stony irons are, once again, pretty self explanatory. They're iron meteors that have uh, minerals such as uh, phosphorite, <laughs> all being mixed in with them. This is a classic example. What you see up here is you have an iron matrix. In other words, it's probably from the core of a differentiated body. When I say a differentiated body, what I mean is big enough to where the heavy elements sank and the lighter elements went to stay by the surface, just like the Earth. You have the crust, the mantle, and the core. This probably came from the core mantle, uh, core mantle boundary because you have these olivine crystals here. This is a brahim. It's called, it was from Russia. We have an actual sample of brahim over there you can take a look at. These are the prettiest of the meteorites. They're also the most rare. Uh, eh, very tiny percent, one or two percent of the meteorites. And uh, they also tend to command a good price too. So once again, an earth, an earth analog, this is olivine from, it was called a xenolith. It was coughed up in a volcano. And that's how you access the mantle on the earth. Next one, please. Okay, and then we have irons. Irons are total iron meteorites. Irons uh, are probably one of the, maybe the second most common meteor that hits. Inside an iron, you have what's called the Wittmannstadt pattern. Those are Basically, two minerals, camosite uh, uh, and tenite. Uh, the camosite the, is the uh, brighter lines there. The tenite may actually be pretty hard to see. We have a nice example of that over on the table, too. What you have to do is you have to take your iron meteorite, slice it down, polish it, and then etch it with acid. You see the crystal structure inside. Next, please. And then we have what are called tectites. Tectites are interesting. It's meteoric glass. When an impactor hits the Earth or the Moon or whatever, the uh, temperatures and the pressures are tremendous. What it does, oftentimes, the impactor is vaporized. And whatever it hits is heated so much that it becomes glass. That picture there is a picture of Libyan desert glass. And that's an interesting glass. For years, people argued about it. The story of how they were found is fascinating. A really fascinating story. We could probably talk all night on it. But for many years, people argued, is it, is it a tectite or is it just some kind of glass that was out in the desert? It's found in the Great Sand Sea in Egypt. It's on the Egypt-Libyan border. Uh, now you cannot collect those. It's too dangerous. Uh, the Egyptian government will not let you in the area. Uh, they have been found also, examples of this glass were found in uh, Tutankhamun's necklace. When Lord Carnarvon went into the tomb, originally it was thought to be Chalcedon, which is a, a type of quartz. But with uh, 
more, with more research, they found that it was this Lydian glass. So people have known about it forever, but like I say, there were a lot of arguments. Some were smart, some were not so smart. They were pretty heated generally. Now it's accepted as a tectite, so it's a meteoric glass. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. This is probably one of the more interesting things we'll see tonight. This layer of clay, which you see right here, the white layer on the top, that's the KT boundary, or the KPG boundary as it's known today. Uh, it was originally described by Walter Alvarez in Gubbio, Italy. It can be found in quite a few places in North America, in Haiti. It represents an event in time to where below it, this is the Cretaceous period when the last of the dinosaurs. When you think of dinosaurs, uh, Cretaceous dinosaurs, think Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park had the, sounded good, but it had the dinosaurs wrong. So these were the tyrannosaurs and things like that. 65 million years ago, a large impactor, this actually has a name, it's called Baptistina, hit offshore down by the Yucatan in Mexico that caused <laughs> the last of the great, the great extinctions. Uh, when I was going to school, they had just proposed that. There were people that accepted, there were people that didn't accept it. Now it's very well accepted. And it's an exciting time because there have been discoveries about this event that really changed the picture. You might have been taught that, well, yeah, the meteor hit and it created a big cloud and the earth cooled for a while while the plants died, plant eaters died, you know, the meat eaters died. Totally different now. And we have a sample here. Definitely, I, you can see it. There's a sample here that shows micro tectites. They're tiny spherules. These tiny spherules now are probably what caused the extinction. Imagine a large body, maybe the size of Mount Everest, hitting the earth, vaporizing a tremendous amount of material. A lot of that material is ejected into space, goes into orbit, but low Earth orbit. And some of it may have got to the moon, some very low well may have got to Mars. But what happens? What comes up? must come down. And that's exactly what took place. It looks very much now like these micro tectites, and, and they're right here. That was the best meteorite show on the planet for a few hours. <laughs> so as these came down, of course, they heat up. And if anybody here from the physics department or whatever, what is conserved? Energy. Energy. So the energy that went into heating the meteorites up, where's it got to go? got to go into the atmosphere once the meteorite disintegrates. So basically imagine a rain, tiny, tiny balls coming in. Uh, there's a professor, he was at Jay Malosh. He's a physicist and a geologist, great man, recently died. Uh, he really rewrote what happened at that time. Probably <laughs> Most of the animals died probably within hours of the impact. No one knows for sure, but anywhere from three to five hours would be a reasonable thing. Uh, because of that energy of these tectites coming back into the atmosphere, it's estimated that they were raised the atmospheric temperature well over a thousand degrees. Yeah. Is that everywhere on Earth? Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. It was worldwide. It was planet wide. If you were a dinosaur on the other side of the planet, when it hit, you might not notice. It wasn't that big. It's not like planet coming. But what happened is when it alters, and when these tectites come back in, they alter the atmosphere so radically that now it's worldwide. So you have evidence of fires. Uh, there is a very exciting date site right now. In uh, North Dakota, in the Hell Creek Formation, it's called Tanis. Uh, the person who is doing the work claims that it actually there are evidence there is evidence of that day. That would be an extraordinary claim to find. You know, to say that you have something of one day is almost impossible. He might be right. There, are, yeah. 
Is that where they found the fish gills? Yes. Yes, fish gills were full, uh, full of tectite material. Animals had been thrown. Uh, there were turtles that were skewered on tree branches, probably due to not a tidal wave. A tidal wave wouldn't have reached there, but it would have been called a scythe wave. If you ever get inside a bathtub, you know, you slide around, especially when you're young and you hate your parents and you start doing this number, that's a scythe wave. And that's probably what took place. And the reason we think that is because during the Japanese earthquake, uh, the, Fuku the Fukushima disaster, actually fjords in Norway did the same thing. Not quite to that extent, but they did, they did move. So it's very exciting. And we have some of those balls here that you can look at. Below it, no dinosaurs. Above it, nothing. Some animals do make it through. Some animals do. Yep. Thanks. Here we go. An important meteorite. We have a top, we have an example of it, the Allende in Mexico. This is really an important meteorite. It's a stone. It's called a chondrite. You see these round features here? These are little igneous systems of themselves. They're, el they're minerals that were very, they could take very high temperatures. They're called refractory minerals. These irregular blobs. These are calcium aluminum inclusions, CIAs. Those contain material that predates the solar system. Much of that's interstellar material. That is the first material of the solar nebula. Predates the planets. It is also, it's an important meteorite. It's totally unaltered, very primitive. Uh, age dated about 4.2 billion years old. And we have it here, and you can look at it. It's got the chondrules, and it has the calcium aluminum inclusions. You won't find those features in any terrestrial rock. When you see chondrules, it's a meteorite. Okay. Okay, meteorites have altered the world. This is a gravity map. This is the. Uh, this was taken by Pemex, Mexico Oil Company, and it is a gravity map of the crater that the Baptistina, that asteroid which hit the planet. It's one thing to make a it's one thing to make a theory that you have this, but then you got to look for a crater. Well, the oil companies had the data for ages. But oil companies are pretty tight with their data. Uh, that also happened with Chesapeake Bay impact uh, crater was it was very well suspected even after post after World War II it was noted. But uh, it's when the oil companies gave up their data is when the real proof came in. So that's what you're seeing there. That's a gravity map. You can see a central peak right here, peak rings that are raised outside. So these meteors have altered the Earth for quite a while. So radical. This is some of the work that I did recently. Uh, you don't have to go to Mexico to find an impact crater. The Chesapeake Bay impact crater was discovered by actually two people I know, David Powers and uh, E. Scott Bruce of the Department of Environmental Quality in uh, Virginia. But the center of impact is probably Cape Charles. And what this picture is, this picture is a LIDAR image. It's a, it's a technology that didn't exist when I was working. It's something very new. And it's funny, I went to the USGS website and was working with it. And the reason I went there was because this crater, that's the Chesapeake Bay impact crater really is about two miles below our feet. It was 35 million years ago, a lot of sediments have filled in. It does still affect us today, but you won't see it directly. I knew of two places that you could see surface effects and I went to one of them. It was on Highway 171 uh, going from uh, Newport News over to Pocosin. There is a drop off at Big Bethel Road. It catches, for geologists, it catches your eye immediately. 
why does this road drop off so much and then it's dead flat, flat as pool table to the coast? And I said, well, you know, who knows? So it could have been an old shoreline. The Big Bethel Scarp was considered an old shoreline. Uh, you see this straight area here? This may have been a sea stand. You have, don't see it quite so closely. There's a Suffolk Scarp and there's a Surrey Scarp out here. Here it is, right here. These are old sea level stands. But when you look at the, when you look at the picture, what do you see? You see a circular pattern coming down, around through Long Creek. Here's Cape Henry. And it's all centered on Cape, Cape Charles, on the Eastern Shore. Also notice the rivers. The rivers are coming down. And what do they do? Instead of continually going down, they make a hard turn. Well, why would you do that? Same thing, uh, James River, hard turn. York River, hard turn. Uh, further north, they do. That area right here at Pocosin, this is Pocosin Creek. This was thought to be an old shoreline. I don't think it is. I think it's, I think it's a service expression of the crater two miles below. I mean, it lies on that crater. Pocosin Creek does the exact turn. So who, who knows? Interesting. More technology, new things to see, okay? Uh, this was my last project. My last project uh, was with uh, Hampton Road Sanitary, Sanitation District, the HRSD Swift Wells. What we were doing is drilling through the coastal plains all the way to bedrock, which is very rarely done. Costs a lot of money, it's hard. Uh, we drilled the core Right there, we cored down to 1,200 feet before we hit bedrock. This is in uh, Ron Springs Park in uh, Williamsburg. And part of what we drilled through is a formation called the Exmoor Tsunami Deposit. When the meteor that hit that created the Chesapeake Bay Impact Crater, much of the material is literally thrown out into a tsunami that probably goes as far as Richmond, maybe. Mood, it's hard to say. As the material came back, it drags it all back into the center of the crater. That's the export tsunami deposit, is that material. And so we went through that. I have a, I had it at home, and I have some micro photographs of things that I did, but that was one of my last projects. And it was a lot of fun. It was interesting. What was the goal of that? The goal of it was Hampton Roads has problems. Hampton Roads has big water withdrawals and there's land subsistence. The problem with sea level rise in Hampton Roads is really two things. It's what they call eustatic sea level rise, maybe 1.4 foot every 10 years, something like that. But you also have the land is sinking. The land sinking for two reasons. One, because the ice age glacial sheets melted and what happens? It's like you're sitting on a bed. When you sit on a bed, what happens when you get up? It rises up. And that's one of our problems. Also, I think that some of it is crater settling, sediment settling. Now it's like I say, two miles below your feet, and a lot of it has settled, but I think it's still settling. So that's my two cents on it. But what we were going to do there is inject water deeply down with what's called the Potomac Formation. That's a Cretaceous formation when the dinosaurs were around. Uh, it's an interesting core. You see pictures of burnt wood. Uh, you see pyrite. The pyrite is FES2, iron sulfur. The iron comes from the seawater. The sulfur came from the wood that's rotting away down there. And you see this in the cores. It's pretty amazing. At the time, during the Cretaceous, probably was like a delta, like a river delta. And the burnt wood is not due to the, not due to the media area, it's too old. But there were probably forest fires. So we went through that layer, which is an interesting, it's fun to see and it's fun to do. Also, I had a chance to work with uh, T. Scott Bruce, one of the two original authors of this uh, Chesapeake Bay Impact Crater. So that was a lot of fun. Work with a very senior scientist. And that's a that's a micro photograph that I took. 
what you see here, these pieces of quartz, they've, some of them have been analyzed. There are shock, there are shock structures in it, probably a bit of iridium. Also, there, in this picture, there is none, but there are fossils. When they originally did the pouring, you can date these fossils. And the person who did it was called John Cedarstrom. And when they checked the fossils, they were mixed up all upside down. Uh, Cedarstrom actually almost lost his job. They thought he had messed up the, the cores. But what happens is this meteor hit, it just mashes everything, tears it up. So you got old, old, and new. It's, once again, that's a fascinating story. We could talk for ages on that. Uh, Cedarstrom was back post World War II, 1950s. I say almost lost his job. Cedarstrom was the first person who really thought that it could be an impact structure. He called it Matacomanite formation. Its name is not used anymore. But later, David Powers and T. Scott Bruce did all the work doing quite a bit of doing. So that, what you see there, this black, looks like little balls. It's called glauconite. That's a marine, a marine mineral. So that's what washed back. So meteorites even affect us today. And will again in the future. So. OK, that's enough talking. There are actual samples. A lot of the samples you've seen here, we actually have samples here. Please feel free to come take a look at it. Use the microscope, any of the magnifying things. There is one example of a meteor wrong. It was sold as a meteorite. It would fool everybody on the planet. It's heavy too. If you want to, you want to break a window, this is a good one. <laughs> it looks perfect. It's shiny, magnetic. It weighs a lot, except for a couple little things. So come on up and take a look. If you would, when you do handle them, just handle them by the case. You want me to turn the camera so you can see everybody having fun? It depends. Some can. <laughs> the best way to do it is to buy it from a reliable dealer, but then do independent research. Look for pictures. Of, you know the same thing. Yeah, well, that's a good that's a good sign. If you pay a little, probably not. In fact, that's exactly one of the things here. But it's good. I mean, you come on up and look at the meteors. And if you want to buy a ticket, that's a good time to buy a raffle ticket before the, the drawing is held. Yeah, yeah. Just grab anyone you'd like to see. And we've got the we've got magnifiers there. What gives it away is Yeah. Okay, that's from the field of 
Let's take about another five minutes to look at the meteors and then we'll go to the next segment. Yeah, 
Two minutes. Scientific Educational Organization, uh, and our map motto is bringing astronomy to the people of Hampton Roads. So outreach is our big, astronomy outreach is our big thing. Well, every year, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, who hosts the Night Sky Network, uh, has a pin available for 
outreach, people who have done outreach during the year, a certain amount. So this is a letter I got from them. I'll just read the first paragraph. To the volunteers of the Back Bay Amateur Astronomers, congratulations from NASA's Night Sky Network on your organization's stellar outreach efforts during 2022. We proudly award you these enclosed pins. This is a copy of the pin to recognize your members' commitment to sharing the wonders of space and the latest NASA science. This year's award theme is inspired by NASA's latest and most advanced space-based observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope. So on the pin, it says, Night Sky Network Star 2022, and it's got an image of the James Webb Space Telescope reflector, a mirror. This is a beautiful pin. And I will award the pins for the people who are here. So give me the names. Uh, first up is Anna. Anna, Anna Colway. Yay. Uh, Bruce Powers. Bruce, Bruce. how did I get it to you? <laughs> Who's next? Uh, do you want me to just go through everyone's name? Sure. Okay, everyone's Bob Burlin. Bob Bur Burline. Brian Lafitte. Brian Lafitte. Is Brian here? I don't think so. No. Damien uh, Timon. Damien is not here. David Pugh. David Pugh. David Reed. David Reed. David Wright. David Wright. Eddie Paris. Eddie Come Paris. on down. Hey. Gabriel. Uh, Andre. 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 Gabriel Andre. Okay. Right here. No, just set results. No, no. George Reynolds. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> James Green. James Green's not here. Uh, Jeff Goldstein. Jeff Goldstein. <laughs> Jeffrey Thornton. Jeff Thornton. Jonathan Sheets. Jonathan is not here. All these are. Kim Blackwell. Kim Blackwell already has his. Yep. Lee Flax. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Ost. Mark Ost. Matthew Cook. Matt Cook. Not here. Patrick McLaughlin. Patrick McLaughlin. Not here. Melvin Spruill. Mel's not here. Michael Webster. Mike's not here. Uh, Patrick uh, Bartuli. Yeah, I can't say his last name. Matthew Bartuli. He's <laughs> online. Here, Patrick, I'll throw it to you. Uh, Rachel Perry. Rachel. Robert Schmidt. Bob Schmidt, Robert, not here. Roland Downing, Roland he's Downing. online, I think. He's online, we'll get that to you, Roland. Samantha Erb. Samantha Erb, she's not here. Yeah, here, I'll text her. Sandra Paxson. Sandy's not here. Me. <laughs> no, no, sir. Stephen Newton. Steve Newton. Thomas Flatley. Tom Flatley, not here. And Thomas uh, Shershon. Sershawn? No, Sershawn. Sershawn. Sershawn, okay. Tom Sershawn not here? Okay, well, we've got a bunch to give out still. Still, yeah. To, so I'll get these to the people who uh, are not here. Okay. If, if you feel that your name, like you should have got one, please let us know. These I pulled the name off of everybody who logged their hours on the volunteer for 2022. So I'm sorry if I missed you. Let me know, though, immediately when we still have time that we can order another. Yes, when you go into the Night Sky Network calendar and you click on one of those events and you sign up for that event, make sure after the event, you go back to that event and log your hours and your miles. If you deduct uh, mileage, volunteer mileage on your income tax, it gives you a good record at the bottom, the total of your miles. And you can always go to Google Maps to find out the, the, the mileage between uh, sites. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Time for the door prize drawing, again, which is 
two volumes of The Annals of the Deep Sky by Jeff Knight and Dennis Webb, Survey of Galactic and Extragalactic Objects, Volume 1 and Volume 2. So, all the tickets are in here. I'll let our presenter, our special person, reach in there. Try not to pick your own. <laughs> but if you do, okay, the winning number. Of the uh, two volume set is three six seven one five two one. Oh, okay, hey, it's Rachel. <laughs> Good. Okay. Now, last chance to buy a ticket on the raffle telescope. Has anybody got any money? <laughs> Rick, uh, Anna has the tickets. From all of them. Did we have all the tickets stubbed? Everybody who filled one out. Thank you everyone for purchasing raffle tickets because all that money goes to the Georgia June Scholarship Fund. And I'm checking this up really good. Put the seal here. Make sure it's really shaken up. Some people bought a hundred tickets. Somebody, some people bought one. So hopefully, somebody appropriate. Okay. Thank you for playing. All right. Uh, I do appreciate it though. Because I mean, you guys are going to find the scholarship. <laughs> I'll have David Schuldice to pick out the winning number. The winner of this beautiful telescope is Dale Spitz. His email address, I will contact him. And we'll make arrangements. We've got the box and soak those in. We've got all the attachery, attachment, yeah, all the go with it. Got everything except the cell phone. Right. All right. Okay, so that is our winning. That is the culmination of our scholarship raffle. So thank you all for participating. And uh, is there anything else we need to cover while we're here? Well, then, if you want to hang around and look at the meteors, I'm sure Mark will not mind. Okay. When you're tired, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <He's> tired. <laughs> it, you might have seen him if you've been to the Northwest, Northwest River Park at the uh, Skywatch. He's the guy out in the grass with the big white refractor. Usually sitting in I'm a chair. Really so. Sitting in a chair. Okay. Meeting is adjourned. Later. Oh, okay. Run.